Have you been blessed today? I was blessed. Man, I am just overflowing right now. Just blessed. That music, the worship team was fantastic. The band, you know, when you were playing, oh, I could just feel the Holy Spirit moving through your music. And the Barry, thank you so much for your testimony. So encouraging to us. And God is good. He really is. God has a blessing for us. Anytime we're ready and willing, you know, if we show up on a Sunday expecting a blessing, God will not fail. Sometimes we come to church on Sunday and we're not necessarily expecting a blessing. We kind of have a bad new, bad mood. Uh, things haven't been going so well in the morning. Kids here, then you know, whatever it is. Running late, person in front of you is driving really slow, and and it can just steal our joy. But don't let that happen. Don't let it happen. Well, uh, open your Bibles to the book of Jonah. We're working our way through this book and. Uh, uh, scripture reading this morning is from Jonah chapter 1, 1 through 17. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. But then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell asleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots, and a lot fell to Jonah, on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What did you do? Where do you come from? What is the, your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And this terrified them. And they asked, well, what have you done? They knew he was running away from God because he had already told them so. And the sea was getting rougher and rougher, and so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they crowd, cried out to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. So as we continue this series, we're kind of building one sermon on top of the other. As the story just kind of continues in this narrative form uh, through, from week to week. And last week we saw that God had said to, to Jonah, who lived in Israel, he told him, go to Assyria, the, the ascendant, uh, political power of that day and preach to the capital city of Nineveh about their violence and evil so that they might turn to God. But instead of doing what God had told him to do, to go to Assyria, which was due east, instead he went to Tarshish, which was due west. And in the, it's in Spain area. He, he literally decided to get as far away from God as he possibly could. So he got a, a one-way ticket to the end of the earth at that time. That's how far he wanted to get away from God. And what does God do in response to that? Well, he sends a storm. We talked last week about uh, why Jonah was running away from God and his calling. We talked about his self-righteous attitude and his superiority complex that caused him to despise the Ninevites. 
We talked about how Jonah was not prepared to preach a message of grace because he didn't really understand it himself. He hadn't really experienced it itself. But then we also talked about how God pursued Jonah to win him back. And I want to continue looking at that a little deeper today about God's pursuit of Jonah. God pursues Jonah by sending a storm, by bringing disaster into his life. I mean, it seems so counterintuitive to us, doesn't it? I mean, why would God send a life-threatening storm in order to save his life? I mean, it certainly reminds us that God's ways are not our ways, right? That the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God and vice versa. It also might bring to your mind a little bit of, of Romans 8, 28, which says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And where it might, you know, that, that verse might take us a lifetime to unpack. It becomes increasingly true in our lives as we learn more and more about God. And here in Jonah's life, it takes on a deeper meaning for him when he realizes that God had actually called him to fail. Okay, Jonah was commissioned by God to preach sin and grace to a needy people. And yet he himself knew nothing about sin and grace. Not really. Jonah was asked to do something that he was not equipped to do. Jonah did not understand the message he was asked to give. So in actuality, God was directing him to do something that he would most certainly fail at. He did it to teach him. He did it so that he would grow, so that he would mature, so that he could ultimately become that man of God that, he, that God wanted him to become. But it was only through facing that failure that God would be able to show him the flaws in his life, in his attitude, and in the sin that he had. Jonah would never become the preacher that God was calling him to because uh, until he was able to truly see himself through that lens of failure. He needed to see his own weakness. He needed to see his, his poor thinking. He needed to see his self-righteousness. And he needed to be confronted with the idols in his life, his racial superiority, his religious pride, and his national arrogance. And until he understood that about himself, he would not be able to preach a message of sin and grace. And what God does with this storm that he brought into Jonah's life is he's, he's actually creating a type of intervention. A divine intervention, we might call it. You know, back in, for those of us who are old enough, back in the early 1970s, uh, an Episcopal priest by the name of Vernon Johnson, he started using this new method of therapy, of creating an interruption of love into a person's life that was filled with self-destructive behaviors. And it became a very, very popular tool for, for friends to reach out, especially someone who was struggling with an alcohol or a drug addiction. And they would all gather around their friend who they recognized was not thinking straight because of the addiction. And they would affirmingly share with them of their fears of what would happen to this person if they didn't get help. It was a very effective way to convince people to get some help in their lives. But Father Johnson was not the first to use this method. God had been using this same method for years. And God was basically performing an intervention on Jonah because he was not thinking straight as he was trying to run away, to get away from the calling that God had put on his life. The, the storm comes to Jonah. It's, it's an intervention. It's a way of saying, of God saying to him, until you see that you're not in control of your life, like you think you are. Until you see that, until you recognize it, that you're not, you're not going to be able to, to really achieve my will for your life. You're going to be a failure. And Jonah begins to understand. And he can see that the decisions that he has made has brought this disaster upon him. And he begins to do the right things. Jonah begins to stand up 
and act correctly according to how he should have done, how he should have behaved in the first place. And here's what he does. First of all, notice that the sailors are trying to figure out who's responsible for this storm. It's not a normal storm. I mean, these are seasoned sailors. They can tell the difference. They know that this is not normal. And besides that, they're, they were also very superstitious. But Jonah stands up and admits what he's done. He says, I'm responsible for the storm. Very clearly, very openly, no excuses. He simply admits that he's messed up. And then he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it'll become calm. He says, I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. That, that took a lot of courage. You know, for some of us, we understand what that point is when you hit that place and you got nothing less. And then finally you get the courage to say, I know this is my fault. But it also begins to reflect an understanding of grace in his life. But there's a couple things I think we can learn from this. First, if you've been kind of paying attention to everything that's going on in this account. There's something here we need to deal with, but we need to think about it biblically. And it's this, that Jonah's storm had endangered everybody on that boat. Jonah's sin is endangering not just his life, but also the lives of everyone else on that boat. And really, it's, it's even more than that. He's endangering more than that because, you know, this is not just, you know, a storm with a dark cloud that's just over their little boat, you know, like perhaps you might see in a cartoon. The whole area is experiencing a storm, which means that any other boat, any other sailor on any other boat on the sea could have been endangered because of what Jonah had done. And we have probably all experienced this in some way or another. We have sometimes had to bear the brunt of someone else's storm. We have felt the tremendous and hurtful impact of somebody else's sin breaking on us. Somebody else, through their wickedness, has hurt us, maybe even ruined us. Just like Jonah admits, he says, this storm, yeah, it, it's because of me, it's because of what I've done, but it's put you in jeopardy too. You could be killed by this. That doesn't seem fair, does it? Not at all. I think most of us have heard of the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, Right? became a very popular book very quickly when it was published. I think because it was expressing the sentiment of a lot of people. Because who among us have not thought these kinds of thoughts when some kind of tragedy has hit someone that we knew or even on ourselves, right? We cry out, why is this happening to them? Or why is this happening to me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. Why is it happening? But you see, the very title of the book sets up a, a logical fallacy because the title of the book assumes that life is unfair because some of us, and evidently not all of us, right? Because some of us deserve a wonderful life. Because after all, we're good. Right? Why do bad things happen to good? people. In the Bible, in Luke 13, a bunch of people came to ask Jesus a question when a tragedy happened. They asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, why did the Tower of Siloam fall on these people? Were they worse sinners than others that the tower fell, or, fell on those people? Now, we don't know anything else about the situation other than that. There, there are no newspaper clippings left from, you know, that disaster. I mean, it's the sort of thing that if it would have happened in our time, you know, it'd be, you know, in every newspaper and it would be, you know, it'd be more than that. It'd be on every television and on the internet and everything else. We'd, we'd read about it somewhere. But we don't have any of that information. 
But, but they come to Jesus with their, with their presupposition. And they said, is the reason the tower fell on those people because they were worse sinners than others. That's their thinking. Sometimes it's our thinking. And Jesus said, no. He said, no. And then he added, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mm. In that pregnant little gnomic utterance, Jesus says, dear friends, Please do not be so arrogant to assume that people who have more tragedy in their lives are worse people than you. The truth is, when you think about it, nobody, nobody gets what they deserve. I mean, here is God, right? And he's... He's given us all of our lives. He's created us. He supports us in every single moment. We owe to Him every ounce of our love, every ounce of our being, every ounce of our allegiance and glory. Yet look, look at how we, we live toward Him. I mean, we may, we may acknowledge Him here and there in a, in a rather perfunctory way, but the actual day-to-day -day way in which we go about our own lives? I mean, the truth is we run our own lives. We do our own living the way we want to live. We don't, we don't give him lordship. We don't, we don't think about him all that much in our day-to-day -day activity. We're not giving him love and honor throughout the moments of our day. Instead, what we do is we make all the decisions of our life hinge on our own joy, on our own satisfaction, on our own pleasure, and our own glory. If God gave us what we deserve you know, for the way we treat Him or the way we, we treat one another, for goodness sake, we'd all be wiped out in a blink of an eye. But praise God, He's not like that. God is a merciful God. God will never give you what you deserve. He never gives anyone what we deserve. He always gives us better. And yet Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, Job understood this. Job had gotten this truth down deep into his heart. You know, think when his family, all his kids and his wealth were all wiped out in a storm. He tore his clothes. He fell on the ground. He, he put ashes on his head. And he worshiped God. He worshiped God in the midst of that. All the tragedy, he worshiped God. He said, the Lord has given, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah, things happen to us that we don't deserve, at least in the short run. But in the long run, nobody, nobody, gets what they deserve. The real question is not, why does God allow so much suffering in the world? The real question is, in light of how we treat God and how we treat each other, why does God give us so much good? Why does God give us so much beauty and life and so many wonderful things to enjoy? That's the real logical problem. And the real logical problem is solved when we say, it's because God is a merciful God. Until you get that understanding of this, the world will be an incredibly disappointing place. If someone, something comes into your life that's very bad, and maybe it feels like a tower has fallen on you, do you think that it's God punishing you for your sins? I mean, do you really think that that's the reason why? Do you think that, that you are somehow worse than other people? That this kind of stuff, that this kind of tragedy would happen to you? No, no. That's not how God works. If God punished you for your sins, we'd all be gone. We'd all be gone. Instead, the tower has fallen on you and the pain is in your life because He has a purpose for it. 
Trust him. Go to him. Give yourself to him completely and you'll grow. Don't demand that you deserve a wonderful life. Worship God. Worship him instead. Because he never really gives us what we deserve. And until you understand that, like Job did, you know, Job was able to, to handle his problem because he realized that God was merciful. He realized he had no cause to complain. The great Jonathan Edwards, when he died, he was in his mid-50s when he died. Sarah Edwards um, wrote her daughters as soon as her husband died, and she said this. She said, my dear child, what shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we might kiss the rod that he has laid on our back and not complain. The Lord has done it. God has helped me adore his goodness that we have had your father for so long. My God lives and he has my heart. Can you imagine what an amazing response to a tragic storm that came into her life? But the reason that she could respond in such a way is because she understood sin and grace. She knew the grace of God. That's what enabled her to endure the storm. And until you get these truths down at your heart, the world will be an awful place. Admit your sin and you'll begin to see grace everywhere. But if you hold on to this unrealistic notion of your rights, you'll live a very hard and bitter life. Jonah said, it's my fault. He stands up and he takes responsibility. And at this point, we begin to see what real repentance is. It's fairly simple. If you look and see what Jonah does, he doesn't talk so much about himself. Not at all. He, he gets up and he says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the land, the sea and the land. He doesn't really talk about himself. And real repentance has that approach. In real repentance, you know, you're different than the sailors because the sailors are obsessed with only one thing is how do I get out of this mess? And that's what they're thinking about. They even asked Jonah, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us, they said, for us. What do we do to get out of this mess? And they're willing to do anything. It's like foxhole religion, right? You're faced with a tough time. You, you'll say anything. You'll promise anything, right? You, you'll, whatever it takes to get out of the mess. But that's com a completely wrong approach. Now, there's an interesting parallel between Jonah and the story of Achan. In Joshua 7, early in the Old Testament, uh, when the Israelites were, were uh, going into the Cana, into the Canaan, in Canaanite land to, to conquer it, God told the Israelites, when, when you're in a battle, never take you know, the plunder for yourself personally. Don't, don't take the things in these battles that, that I'm leading you to. Don't take them for your own gain, for your own wealth. And yet a man named Achan did exactly that. He took some plunder and he buried it underneath the floor of his tent. And so the next time the Israelites went out to battle, they were demolished. The people were killed. The army was in disarray and God showed jo jo Joshua that he had removed himself from them. He stopped helping the Israelites because of the sin of Achan. Can you see the parallel? Achan's one sin brought a storm cloud of God's anger and endangered all of Israel. You know, Jonah in the ship and Achan in the camp. And when Joshua goes to Achan, he says, My son, give glory to God and confess to him. Which is a very different approach than what the sailors took, right? Joshua doesn't say, Achan, you brought us to the brink. You know, because of you and your decisions, we're all in danger. He doesn't say, because of you, everybody's scared and my leadership has lost its credibility. He doesn't do it. That stuff doesn't really matter. Not, not to his heart at this point, not in the long run. 
I mean, it's certainly horrible that he has caused such terrible things, but, but that's not the main thing in his own repentance. The main thing is that by your disobedience, you have robbed God of his glory. Your, your disobedience to God, you, you've, you've refused to give God what is due him. You haven't given him the center of your life. So, so the only thing you really should worry about is not what you've done you know, around. That's not the problem. The problem is, is you need to look at God. You see what you've done to God. Begin to see who He is. Recognize that your sin is to God. I mean, that's what repentance is. And Jonah immediately begins to think about God. He says, my God is the God of heaven and earth. He's beginning to think about the greatness of God. The goodness of God. And he's saying, how could I have been so stupid to think that I could get away from the creator of heavens and earth? How can I be so ungrateful to the one who has given me every aspect of my being? He, he says, I'm a Hebrew. Right? What? It means I, I was one of those people who was defined by captivity. I was enslaved, but now I'm free. And I'm called to represent God before the nations, but instead I've thrown a veil over his love and grace. And Jonah is finally starting to get his mind off himself. And he's beginning to start thinking about something that's bigger than just him and his opinions. And because of that, he's moving towards repentance. Repentance is not possible until you begin to see that you and your desires are not the main thing. And Jonah was arriving at that place. And in his heart, he begins to think, how, how could I have done this to God, my deliverer? How could I have run away from my creator? And with his eyes off of himself, Jonah knows what he has to do. He says, the only way I'm going to get you guys out of this danger is you have to throw me into the raging sea itself. Jonah stopped making excuses. He stopped any defense mechanism he may have had. He stopped any rationalization. And he says, this is what I deserve. This is my sin. And when they throw him in, without even knowing it, what Jonah is doing is he's finding grace beneath the waves, underneath the water, because underneath the water, there is love. God put in the heart of the storm a provision for saving Jonah. And it wasn't until Jonah finally said in repentance, I give myself utterly to you and to your will. What, do whatever is fair. Do whatever you think is right with my life. It was only then that God could rescue him. Just like always, Whenever you obey God in dark times or whenever you turn to the Lord with a sincere heart of repentance, you will always find that underneath the waves is a gracious provision. You know, something kind of similar happened with Jesus. You know, when Jesus gave himself up to be destroyed on the cross, it was then that it was his ultimate triumph. You know, in the Christian life, it's always kind of this way, you know, the, the way up is by bringing yourself low. The way, the way to, uh, to live is to die to yourself. The way to find yourself is to lose yourself in Jesus. The way to freedom is to surrender yourself to His will completely. And Jesus gave Himself utterly to the Father in obedience. And because He did, He was exalted above all others. And Jonah threw himself completely into the justice of God and found underneath the waves God's gracious provision. God sends storms into our life as interventions to show us who we really are. And the right way to respond is to repent, to get rid of your self-pity, to get your heart off of yourself, to look to Jesus, to look to Him and to recognize that you can be forgiven because He substituted for you on the cross. He paid for everything that you've done. And it's interesting, but without even knowing it, jo Jonah is walking in the steps of Jesus, who years later would say, as Jonah was in, it, it was in death for three days and then came back, so I will die and rise again. Jesus Christ, just like Jonah, was the substitute. 
you know, Jonah substituted himself in a sense, and he said, throw me over so that you won't drown. And Jesus Christ, who didn't deserve to drown, was the ultimate substitute. He was thrown into the wrath of God so that all our waywardness, so that all our selfishness, all our sin could be paid for. And if you recognize that we have a God who substitute himself for us and got rid of our sin, and in that way, you can then have a relationship with God. You know, I, I couldn't believe in a God who didn't substitute himself the way that he did in the form of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because how can you live in a world with such pain that we live in and worship a God that was immune to it? But that's not the case. We have a God who understands the storms, what they're like in our life, because he came into the world in the form of Jesus Christ and dove straight into the greatest of pain, into the wrath, and into the justice that, that should have fallen on us as sinners. But instead, he substituted himself. And because he did, we can have life. But what are you going to do with all this? Are you going to be like the Jonah who ran away from God, just angry and upset, thinking I deserve something better, thinking you know better than God? Or are you going to be like the Jonah who finally came to his sense, sense of it, the wrong decisions and the mess he was making in his life? If you humble yourself, put yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will rescue you and he'll bring you through the storm. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would enable us like Sarah Edwards did, like Job did, like Jonah did, even, even like Jesus did, to, to humble ourselves when your interventions come into our lives and to see it's only by getting our minds off of ourselves, seeing our lack of, of, of competence to run our own lives and getting ourselves, giving ourselves to you that, that we're able to ever come to, to know you. And Father, we know if we give ourselves to you that there is love waiting to save us. There is a gracious provision even under the angriest of waves in our lives. And we just pray that you would enable us to trust our lives to you, to your care. To see that no one else has the words of eternal life but you. And so we give ourselves to you in this way. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Songsters are going to come and they're going to sing, they're going to lead us in our vocal benediction. But we want all of you to sing along with us. The words will be on the screen. I'm sure it's a familiar song, but please uh, stand and join us as we sing our benediction together.